All right, we're going to do a classic audio IC repair. I realize that um, I'm getting some calls or emails about how are we doing audio IC disease these days because we've done it a few different ways on our channel. And when I look to, to teach end users about what's going on with audio IC disease, the videos that we have are from when we first discovered it and a different kind of you know interesting speed method but i don't have a classic repair video so that's the point of today i'm going to do a classic repair video and then later we're going to edit this down into something short and shareable for end users so that you can understand in five minutes what's up with this particular fault so here we have a classic presentation this is an iphone 7 or 7 plus this one's a 7 7 plus um, this this tends to primarily be in the 7 but also in the 7 plus and audio IC disease has a you know kind of a wide range of presentations here's the classic presentation that I look for when I'm diagnosing this problem if I go to try to make a voice memo and it says it just doesn't let me and it says you know this says recording has failed no no audio devices are found that is diagnostic for audio IC disease. Another thing that I can try to do is see whether or not Siri can hear me. So if I try to conjure up Siri and I ask, Siri, can you hear me? Siri, can you hear me? And I get nothing. That's another sort of classic presentation. Now, how do you figure out you have audio IC disease as an end user? The most common symptom is when folks uh, complain that people can't hear them on phone calls. So caller can't hear me. And I made a little handy symptom list. All of these things are, are ways that the same problem can show up in your device. Callers can't hear you or when you're listening, you can't quite hear them. Having static on the ear speaker or the loudspeaker, Siri can't hear you. Like we just showed, voice memo doesn't work. If you have videos, like the camera videos, but it doesn't record the audio or it won't even let you try. And then the classic uh, is a long, like three to five minute boot time. So all of those are the same exact problem. Now, what is the problem? The problem is common flexion damage. So I talk about flexion damage on my channel a lot, and I really love this, um, my little lego toy that i've made so if you haven't seen that i'm going to show you guys this again uh let's see how i can let's get rid of our audio symptom list and let's get rid of this side camera all right so i'm going to show you exactly how you get into this mess so when you have the large flat bendy phone like this iphone 7 plus and it has a logic board that's inside. The logic board is screwed down into the phone in the iPhones. That's different than the Samsung phones where the logic board just floats inside here. So that in the iPhone, stresses from bending and moving around, putting it in your rear pocket, just that normal daily use is transmitted right to the logic board. So the logic board inside that phone is kind of going for a ride a little bit. And I've got this thin lego board with some different size legos on it and you can see what happens if you just kind of simulate you know what would happen if you kind of had bendy bendy twisty flexion going on you can see that the little tiny chips those guys will just sort of ride up and down just fine but the big chips you can see what's happening see how that big chip is lifting up right there the big chip is lifting up away from the underlying board, and that's what happens in audio IC disease. The audio IC chip itself, there's nothing wrong with a chip. It just pulls up on its connection pad, pulls up on that pad, and it pulls it up, rips it up, and once you get a weakness or a break in the C12 pad for the master clock line, then that triggers that whole host of symptoms that we call audio IC disease. And that's what's going on with this 7 Plus. So let's go ahead and see what does it take to fix the problem. So I'm going to take this board out and let's check in with chat since this is a live stream. All righty. Um, let's see. TriStar Tester is the business. Yes, everybody likes the TriStar Tester. All righty. 
what time is it now? And complaints about resolution. Mm, that, I haven't made any changes, so I don't know what's up with that. Not something I'm going to fix now, that's for sure. Alrighty. All the streams, so many good streams. Okay, so this, this stream is probably going to be kind of boring if you already know about audio IC disease. But if this is, your, um, if you, if this is happening to you, then, then you might get something out of it. I just want to have a stream on my channel that shows how we approach this um, every day, today, the current method. Current method is exactly what I'm getting ready to do. Um, so number one with the current method is I've already started here by reballing, pre-reballing, pre-balling, if you will, a pre-balled audio IC. So in order to make this repair successful in the 7.7 Plus, you need to use leaded solder, leaded balls, which have the lower melting temperature than the lead-free. So these chips come with lead-free solder. So you got to take a brand new chip, you got to ditch all those native balls, and you've got to reball it with the leaded solder. Now you can do this in batches, and that's what I like to do kind of on Sunday night, is to make a stock of these, and that makes your job, your audio IC jobs that might walk in, a really straightforward thing that you can do in an hour or less. All right, let's see. Okay, does it only apply to the seven plus or the seven as well? It's, I think, primarily in the seven. I see more seven than seven plus. All right, let's see. Uh, the best teacher and the best person to make it relatable to the average Joe. Thanks, guys. Oh, man. All right, so under the microscope, what I'm doing now is I have a preheater. So you can see this preheater. This is going to slowly bring the board up to temperature in a way that allows all of the solder on the bottom side of the board to kind of gently expand rather than pop, expand, off-gassing, and bridging. So this allows me to be able to use less top heat and I end up being able to have less risk to the board overall on the iPhone 7 jobs using the preheater, which we sell at iPad Rehab Supply if you don't have one yet. This is the one that we recommend. So now I'm going to go ahead and put this board on the preheater and we can show you on the side cam what it looks like. So here I've got the board on the preheater. And you have to calibrate these preheaters. There's a video on the channel on how to calibrate them. Um, we're going to calibrate them, and then you have to pick your sort of sweet spot temperature. Now, you want to kind of put the board on here, then turn it on, and it will come up to temperature. Uh, the one, the temperature that I use here today is um, about, uh, I think I'm going to come down a little bit. Let's do... On this one, 145. The one at home, I do 128. So it's, they're each kind of their own thing. What I look for is that sign of kind of a smokiness of the flux. And that kind of tells me that it's in the neighborhood of the right temperature. All right, so we're going to let this kind of come up. All right, how complicated is it to repair an iPhone with water damage? Well, either easy or really, really hard. That, the answer, like so many questions, are, is it depends. So I'm going to go ahead and clip this in. So you can see I'm clipping in here. And then, I'm, and then what I like to do is I like to peel the shield sticker. Trying to make this more sort of friendly for editing. We're going to have a video editor coming soon. I like to peel the sticker like that, and then I like to use this other clamp to kind of hold that sticker back. And that way, at least, I can kind of put the sticker back on when I'm done. There we go. So I've peeled the sticker back and placed it underneath this clamp. All right, let's look under the microscope. Is the heater absolutely necessary? No, it's not. And some people don't, don't use them, and you can... You know, like anything, these are, this is an art. This is exactly why we do our training in person because, you know, everybody's got a style and you can kind of get a feel for it. And with experience, you can kind of do it any way you want. All right, here is the audio IC chip itself. 
And we know that along this border right here, all the way down, this is where problems happen because there's this gap here. You've got a big chunk of metal and then you've got sort of a score line, the separation here where the SIM tray and the NAND flash memory are here on the right. And then you've got nothing just all the way down there. That's just the, the thin board. So that forms a score line so that bend deflection happens right there along that line. And that really bothers this large chip, the audio IC. So we're going to take note of the chip's orientation with this triangle marking the A1 top corner. And we're going to go ahead and take this off. Now I like to add flux. You don't have to add flux to remove, but I like to because it kind of is a little bit of a visual cue. I like to see the flux, you know, kind of bubbling. And if I don't, then I might bring, that might be a cue for me to bring up my temperature on this thing. You never know. These things, you know, these preheaters are uh, are not UL listed. They're not highly systematically tested and very, very uniform. So they're kind of all over the place. Really indispensable tool. But, yeah, you, know, you know, you might need to, you know, it might stop working at any time. You got to pay attention. All right. So let's see. Um, okay. The preheater helps a lot. Best thing. Yes. Hey, Jessa, I usually have a lot of NC, not connected pads, come off when cleaning the board after IC is lifted. How can I avoid it? Less heat. My question back to you would be, why, why do you care? If a not connected pad isn't connected to anything, it doesn't really have a purpose, and therefore it's not, not, and <laughs> not connected, not important. All right, let's go ahead and take this audio IC off. So we're going to have to just kind of guess and maybe make up a temperature. And after a while, you kind of get into the swing of things with your station. And I usually do these at home. So I'm going to take a guess on what seems like a good medium temperature. And then I'm going to let the board feed back and tell me whether or not I'm off track or not. All right. So I'm just going to kind of pick a, pick a uh, you know, little bit of a typical temperature here and airspeed. Now you can go, some people go really hot with a very low flow and they can aim the air over here towards the NAND. Other people will go with a more moderate uh, temperature and moderate flow. All right, I'm gonna use tweezers. Now I'm not, I'm gonna try to not grab that chip very tightly. I don't wanna get those tweezer marks. All right, so I'm just gonna kind of be at the ready and now I'm going to heat it up. And I'm watching how that flux behaves. All right. So now my chip is off and I can look at it to see whether or not I can reball that chip later at my next batch or not. So we can kind of look at it. And what we're really looking for is, are there any chunks, nicks, dings taken out of it? This one looks good. So I'm going to add it to my go ahead and reball this later pile. So reball later. All right. I like to do my cleanup off of the preheater. So I'm going to put the preheater away. And the reason that I do that is because I don't want to uh, clean these pads and float any of these little dudes. They're really easy to just snick into the, into the iron and then come off. And then that's a big drag. NC equals no care. That's right. Okay. Okay. Jessa, have you tried the solder on the tip removal of the audio IC? Yes, I think those, I mean, those, that method is great if you, if you have really tight clearance or some sort of a reason. I find it to be very messy for this and unnecessary. So it's not the way we do it. And that's the point of this video. This is the way that I actually do audio IC jobs today. So we change things over time and sometimes our YouTube can become out of date with how we're currently doing the repair. So we're not doing the quick method that's on our channel from earlier. We're doing this, which I'm going to call the classic method. All right. So we're going to um, 
make the pad suitable for soldering a new chip by cleaning them up with an iron. So we're gonna put, we're gonna kind of make a wet paintbrush here. Gonna tin the tip of the iron. All right, and then we're just gonna kind of go through here with plenty of flux and just sort of gather up. Gather up what's left of the balls. There we go. I wanted to kind of poke around there enough to get one of those uh, NC pads to come up. NC pads are not connected to anything. And so, you know, you can allow them to just float right away. That doesn't really make, it make any difference. So don't worry about your NC pads. Okay, next we need to correct the problem from the, the actual problem. So how did we get into this mess? Remember here from our bendy bendy flexion, where did that actually happening? It's happening along here on this row of pads. And the one that seems to be problematic is the C12 pad. So the C12 pad is this third one down right there. So, uh, even if right now this one, oh, there's a little solder ball flying around. Um, even if right now this one it lo looks great, everything's fine. You can see how difficult it was to figure this out from the beginning about a year ago. And uh, on some of them, the C12 pad is, is obviously floppy. On this particular board, I, I diagnosed this as, yep, it's audio IC disease. It had all of those symptoms. And then when I went to uh, take the board out, just there was enough pressure that it started working again, which is, you know, a real drag when that's the one that you're getting ready to stream for your classic case. So I, I took the board and I kind of, you know, took the, took the phone I put it back together, I took it apart, I put it back together again, and now it's not working. So this would be a fairly mild case of audio IC disease to begin with. So now let's go ahead and solve the problem. We're going to strengthen that C12 connection so that no matter how much normal flexion goes on, this chip, the audio IC chip, can pull up on C12 without actually pulling the pad and severing the connection there. So we're gonna do that by adding a little bit of a very, very thin copper wire. So this is 44 gauge copper wire, very, very, very thin. And also something that if you wanna give this a try, you can get at iPad Rehab Supply, iPadRehab.com. All righty. Whenever she feels like it. No schedule, right? Your mother was an NC pad. <laughs> what temperature is your iron right now? I never change the temperature on this iron, so, you know, whatever, whatever it's been for the last three years. That is not a, that's not a, a, a variable. All right, so you need to make your thin wire a gray hair. They do not come, uh, they come with insulation. So you need to get rid of the insulation so that it makes a jumper wire. All right, now we're gonna find our spot. So the camera's a little bit offset from my microscope tonight. I'll see if we can make it clear for you guys. All right, so we can read the board here and we can see that the problem area, the C12 pad, and you can kind of see this pad, this entire trace, this little diagonal line there, that's what lifts up 
And that's the part that we're going to strengthen. Where does it go? It goes to this resistor right there. Some prefer 43 gauge. Oh, really? One of the, the better innovations at iPad Rehab was Christy, who um, is one of the iPad Rehab moms. And she has a pretty elaborate sewing machine. She used to make cloth diapers professionally. And so she took the, the wire home and she put it on her sewing machine and spun it into individual little bobbins, which is a great way to kind of uh, keep it in one place with all of your different sizes. All right, so we're going to just tack this on in theory. If I can get rid of the other end of it. Oh, see, look at that. Just the simplest touch, and that C12 pad came up. Now, look, I can touch, okay, bad example. <laughs> I can touch the other ones that are not NC pads nearby, and they, they won't come up. You know, you can kind of touch pads over here, and they're not going to come up. Um, so why does that pad just, just lift away? Because it is floppy. It is, it is barely there to begin with. There. So now the C12 pad is torn from its trace because it was, it was already flexed and folded and creased. And we know that because this phone had the symptoms. It was symptomatic for this same audio IC problem. All right, so now there's really sort of no question. All right, let's... Get our jumper on here. These tweezers are, one side is a little shade longer than the other. These ones are too fat. That's probably the, the biggest drag with the, um, <laughs> do it working at home a lot. And that your good tweezers are at home. Okay, so let's cut our micro jumper. So the micro jumper itself, this wire, even though it's so very thin, it's actually really heavy duty compared to the pad itself. So this wire will really immunize the board so that it can't get the same problem in the future. And it allows us to offer a lifetime warranty on our audio IC repairs because this is a really, really robust solution to that original problem. All right, let's see. Oh, these tweezers are really jinky. Let's try a third pair of tweezers. How about these ones? These ones are thick. They're thick, but they might d get the job done. All right. Now let's clean that up a little bit just so that you can see what that looks like. All right. Why other techs scratch the line? No, no reason. No reason at all. I mean, you can. If you have trouble placing this, placing this jumper, then you, you might find it easier if you give it a broader surface to adhere to. We like to, to not do that because what we're doing is leaving it having, allowing that jumper to have some play. Because remember back to the, how did it get to be like this? If you leave the jumper slightly longer in, an, in a little bit more L-shaped instead of tight, then it allows it to kind of move with the board and not pull apart and cause the problem again. All right, so now we can, kind of, we can see that we have our piece of wire that is connecting um, the adjacent resistor. We're substituting for the now missing C12 pad. So alternatively, we, were, we would have been strengthening it because it's the same problem. There's a weakness in the connection of the pad as it's being pulled up uh, from the board itself. Hey, Jess, I wonder so why so many iPhones have the same issues right out of the box. Well, it doesn't. That's impossible. 
right out of the box means right out of the refurbished box. Now, remember, I just told you guys that this foam had, it came here with a complaint of audio IC disease. And when I first looked at it and said, is this really audio IC disease? It, it was, it had the grayed out voice memos and it had the classic symptoms, Siri couldn't hear me. I set up the stream, I took the, the screws out to make it more efficient. And then when I went to test it again, audio was working, what the heck? So you can imagine that in an intermittent problem where you're, you're having to kind of pull and lift and twist, the weakness can, somehow, can sometimes be masked during testing because by chance, it's making a good connection when you go to test that. So it's really reasonable that at a big Apple Depot where they're just assessing all of the iPhone 7 and 7 Pluses that they've taken back in for screen cracks and unrelated problems, that in a quick you know, test, uh, how's audio working? Fine. Then it gets refurbished, put back in the white box, and it goes back to the shelf to be sold to another customer for $349 as a, as a you know, replacement, remanufactured, whatever they like to call it. They don't like to use the, the true word refurbished iPhone 7, 7 Plus. So right out of the box, that's right out of the refurbished box where you're opening up somebody else's used iPhone 7 or 7 Plus logic board that has been bendy, bendy, twisty in their pocket for who knows how long. So just like iPhone 6 Plus touch disease, iPhone 7, 7 Plus audio IC disease, it's the same exact mechanism. All right, now we're ready to put our chip back on. So remember, I like to use chips that are already reballed to leaded solder. So I'm just gonna grab one of those and we're gonna go back on the preheater and stick this on. I work for a large insurance company for Verizon and I get this call on brand new ones too. I would, I would think that the most likely case is that what you think is brand new are refurbished phones. You know, I, I, may, I may be wrong, but that would be my, um, that would be most likely. All right, so let's go to the side cam here and see if it's still working, it is. All right, so we're gonna put the board back on the preheater and I'm gonna position my chip. So I have my already reballed chip. So let's go ahead and check that out under the microscope. So let's find our spot. All right, we're gonna add a thin layer of flux. We're gonna make sure to get the orientation exactly, you know, back the same way it was. This time I can see a little bit of blink, blinking of the flux bubbling over here. Yesterday I did a baseband CPU job that was like so perfect. It, it actually soldered itself because of the leaded solder uh, while leaving all of the lead free perfectly fine. Okay, so let's, um, let's see. For my install, I can take my heat down a little notch. And some people will prevent the jumper, which we can see our jumper. There it is, there's our jumper. We can see our jumper right there. Some people will use a UV curable solder mask like this stuff here, which you know is something that if you're just doing one of these, you might wanna pursue that, but it's not necessary. With practice and experience, you can place the jumper, keep an eye on it, and you'll be okay. It won't suck into the adjacent balls. All right, so let's go ahead and solder this back down and we'll see how it goes. All 
All right, I think that's probably good. We'll see. If not, then we can always come back and reflow it a second time. But we'll try to kind of err on the side of caution because too much heat can overheat the bottom side of the board and then you have to do the relatively bigger job of taking off the baseband CPU and reballing that because that guy doesn't like the heat from the audio IC job. All right, so we're going to let the board, now I've taken it off of the preheater, and we're going to let the board cool down, and then we'll test. How do you align the IC? Just putting it back more or less how it was. You don't want to spend too much time because it has to find its own way. Lifetime warranty sounds good, but isn't the life of a modern cell phone three years, give or take? Whatever it is, you know, it, it is what it is. I don't know what the lifetime is. Depends on who you talk to. One thing that I realized when I, I was, um, I got into it on Reddit, uh, Reddit R Apple, those guys, the diehard Apple fanboys. Um, and I try to be reasonable with, with arguing on, the, on forums. And one of the things that was, was a difference between those guys and me was our general perception of how long an iPhone would last. So I made the argument about, this is about right to repair stuff and parts, that 90% of all iPhones would eventually have a cracked screen and need to get a screen replacement. And they thought that was made up and ludicrous. Um, and maybe it is high, but that's my experience. Everyone that I know uh, would has certainly had a cracked screen. Certainly all of my children, anyone in my family, anyone in my community that I can think of, I would have come across them because they came in here, you know, so the people around here tend to be fixers. So they're going to fix their cracked screens. They're going to, they're going to own that device for long enough that it's going to get a cracked screen. But over on our Apple on Reddit, uh, those guys just, they, they, they will only hold that phone for like a year. And so a lot of them are just like, we don't crack our screens. You know, the, to them, iPhones are, a, you know, beautiful, pristine thing that you get brand new and you keep it for a year and you trade it in and, and you don't do all this repair. So it was really interesting. All right, let's go ahead and put this back in the housing now and we'll see what's up with that. 10 years with the iPhone, never cracked a screen. Well, I sure have. I have yet to crack a screen on the iPhone 10, but I see a lot of them with cracked screens. I did crack, I gave my daughter a phone, I gave her a Google Pixel for, for Christmas, and I cracked the screen on that. It is only, it is less than a month since Christmas, and I have already cracked her Google Pixel screen. I was, I was outside, I think this is pretty typical, I was outside trying to look in a telescope, so it was dark, and then I had a chair, and the chair I thought was on the sidewalk, but it was actually like two legs of it were on the mud, so I was surprised when I sat down in this chair to look in the telescope, and her phone was in my pocket, and it fell out. All right, let's see. They have to have the latest and greatest, whether or not they actually need it. So let's go ahead and reassemble somewhat this phone and see how we did here. All right, let's see, let's see. Will it boot? No. The heck. It should boot. Let's get a charger. Now what you're really worried about when you're doing this job are the common sort of 
sequelae from this. But not booting is not one of them. Yeah, there we go. All right, it's pretty hard to kill an iPhone 7, 7 Plus from a audio IC surgery. She must have been mad at you for breaking her phone. All right, good news. I felt the phone boot up. I could feel that vibration, which, was, which told me right away that audio IC was a success. And I know that because one of the symptoms of a bad audio IC is long boot time. But this was a short boot time. And when I first started out, this thing had the long boot time. So let's go ahead and now uh, check on our voice memos. All right, so remember last time it said no audio devices found. Let's see. Testing, testing, testing. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Testing audio, testing microphone. All right, so there we go. This is fixed for audio I see repair. It has been able to record that voice memo. And now let's see what happens if we try to play it back. Testing, testing. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Testing audio, testing microphone. All right, so our speaker seems to be working fine. And how about you, Siri? Can you hear me? And now Siri can hear me. I can hear you. What's up? Did you miss me when you had audio IC disease? I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> Siri, do you know about audio IC disease? Sickle cell anemia. No, that's not the same thing. Good try, Siri. Um, it's good to have you back. All right. So this phone I'm going to put back together then. And if we're, you know, Siri, we're testing that front microphone. Uh, we're testing a uh, loudspeaker. We can try to record a video. And of course, we can make a phone call. And that would uh, test us to make sure that, um, that the caller can, can hear you now. So this would be our typical audio IC repair that is now immunizes this phone against the original problem. So this bend deflection now can, it's still going to happen, but it can't bother that audio IC chip because the wire that we have there at C12, it can ride up and down. It can be strong now, and it's not going to actually pull that pad up and make that poor connection that we had before. So there you go. That is the classic method. This is exactly how we do our audio IC repairs every day at iPad Rehab. And if you want to learn how to do this, come on and sign up for training. Once a month, we run Practical Board Repair School. Go to iPadRehab.com and click Training under the Services menu, and you can read all about it and sign up for the course right there. We're having our next course we're having a course next week, that's full, but we're gonna have a course in February that you can sign up for. And if you're an end user that has been plagued with this very common problem, you know, don't believe all that stuff out there that tells you, oh, it's unfixable and oh, you gotta get a new phone. It's not. Uh, me and folks like me all over the US and all over the world fix this problem every single day. You can go check out our reviews. You can find a local microsider. And if there's someone that has that, you know, when you say audio I see, they go, yep, I know what you're talking about. They'll probably be able to fix it for you. And it's probably only going to take about an hour. Then your phone is going to be good as new. So keep using those phones and keep them on the road and get your audio I see disease fixed right up.